It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. When Israeli police recommended bribery and fraud charges against him earlier this month, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu dismissed their allegations. After I read the recommendation report, I can say it is biased, extreme, full of holes, like Swiss cheese. But just days later, Netanyahu's corruption scandal is growing. One of Netanyahu's closest and longest serving aides has agreed to become a government witness in a whole new case. The aide, Shlomo Filber, is reportedly prepared to testify about allegations Netanyahu provided favors to Israeli telecommunications company Bezek in exchange for positive coverage on its news website. This follows allegations in separate cases that accused Netanyahu of plotting with a media tycoon to ensure he would receive positive coverage in a different outlet, as well as taking bribes in exchange for helping wealthy donors. Now, all of this threatens Netanyahu's political future, but it continues to overshadow the illegal occupation he oversees. Just today, video was released online of Israeli police beating a Palestinian man in the West Bank city of Jericho. The victim, Yassin al-Saradi, has since died apparently from wounds he sustained during the attack. Phyllis Bennis is director of the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. Welcome, Phyllis. Uh, let's start with Netanyahu, uh, the news breaking this week of an aide flipping, testifying against him in a whole separate case from what we've heard about before. Uh, your thoughts on the scandal, the growing scandal that Netanyahu is facing? Well, the details of the scandal, you mentioned most of them. There's four separate cases underway that have to do with bribery, fraud, and breach of trust, as you said. Uh, the police have recommended that he be indicted. It's now in the hands of the attorney general. And it's really very similar to the situation here in the United States. Uh, there are claims, actually, that Netanyahu sent private investigators to investigate the police that were investigating him. Uh, and is attacking the police forces, very much as we're seeing here with Trump attacking the FBI, who is investigating him. Uh, so there's a lot of, of uh, similarities. I do think that the overview is, is more important in terms of how this really threatens uh, the Palestinians, it threatens the region, it threatens Iran. Uh, there's a great deal of threat involved in this that has nothing to do with the details of these cases. But like in the United States, when Netanyahu is threatened with the possibility of being held accountable for potential crimes, he is responding by uh, making greater military threats even than he has in the past, including just in the last couple of days at the big annual uh, um, security summit in Munich, in Germany, where he said that he threatened Iran that he would go to war directly with Iran, not against its proxies. Uh, if Iran continued its activities. So it's really escalating. It's an escalation of the rhetoric. It's an escalation of the threat level. And it's in situations like this that the possibility rises of an Israeli attack on Gaza, of an escalation in Syria. We've already seen an escalation in the last week or so when there was a, uh, a apparently unarmed drone found in Israeli airspace. It was shot down. No one was hurt, but the Israelis responded with a number of F-16 uh, bomber strikes into Syria, attacking both Syrian and Iranian targets in, in Syria. Uh, that was a, a very serious escalation of the Israeli role in the Syrian war. Uh, and it's now making more even direct threats against Iran. So the moment is a very dicey one, uh, whether or not these cases prove out whether the attorney general has enough uh, political strength to go ahead with them. We're not sure of that. The attorney general has already said it would take several months of investigation to make the decision. But we're in a very dicey moment as a result of the threatened uh, indictment of Netanyahu. Let me ask you about one aspect of Israel's role in Syria that hasn't gotten very much attention, but there was just a, a new a news report about it this week with Isra uh, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz reporting that Israel is stepping up its support to uh, militant groups inside Syria. What's going on there? You know, there's not a lot of information yet about what is different, but it's not a new 
phenomenon that Israel is providing at the very least uh, medical support treating wounded uh, militants who are fighting against the Assad regime and doesn't seem to matter to the Israelis very much whether they are part of, for example, El Nusra, the El Nusra Front in Syria, which is linked to Al Qaeda uh, or other anti-Assad militants. They seem to be willing to take them over the border, uh, treat their injuries and send them back to fight some more. Uh, so I think this, is an on this has been an ongoing reality. The Israeli role has been relatively low key. It has focused primarily on, uh, its bombing raids have focused on going after arms uh, convoys that Israel alleges are going to Hezbollah inside Syria. Uh, they have not had a situation where Hezbollah or others have responded directly against them. There have been some clashes, but they've been quite small scale. The question now is whether those clashes, whether Israeli support for some or all of these anti-Assad forces uh, that are uh, fighting in, in Syria escalates even further as a way of Israel escalating against Iran, or again, whether there's a danger of a direct attack of some sort on Iranian positions, as we saw last week. The Iranians did not respond militarily to that attack uh, on their positions in, uh, in, in Syria. They were clearly not interested in further escalation, but how long that will remain the case, we don't know. If the Israelis continue to escalate their direct assaults on Iranian positions inside Syria. And of course, Iran is there at the request of the Syrian government, which despite its lack of legitimacy in many quarters because of its massive human rights violations, it remains the recognized government in Syria. The other foreign forces that are fighting in Syria, the US, Turkey, and others, uh, as well as Israel, obviously, uh, do not have an invitation or permission from the, uh, the Syrian government. So there's a big legal gap between which forces are there legally, however one judges the legitimacy, and which ones are there illegally as well as illegitimately. Well, you know, speaking of which, just today the Trump administration asserted that it already has the legal authority not just to keep troops in Iraq, which it said before, but also to keep troops in Syria indefinitely, which was uh, a, a recent... Uh, announcement that it made saying that it's even though ISIS has been defeated, it will stay in Syria. But on this front, let's go to a clip actually of something you referenced before, which is Netanyahu speaking a few days ago at the uh, security conference in Munich. Through its proxies, Shia militias in Iraq, the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, Iran is devouring huge swaths of the Middle East. Now, there has been one positive consequence of Iran's growing aggression in the region. It's brought Arabs and Israelis closer together as never before. And in a paradoxical way, this may pave the way for a broader peace and ultimately also for a Palestinian-Israeli peace. So that's Benjamin Netanyahu speaking at the Munich Security Conference. Phyllis, so he's talking about how actual uh, actually a uh, united front uh, between Israel and Gulf states against Iran could lead to a broader regional peace and even directly Israeli-Palestinian peace. What is he saying there? Well, what he's saying, he's referring to the fact that there is in fact a far more public level of alliance right now between Israel and the Gulf Arab states, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, Kuwait, Qatar may or may not be involved. They, they've been a little cagey about it. Uh, but this is a very grave situation. There really is a buildup against Iran designed to isolate Iran. This very much has the Trump administration's uh, involvement all over it. And what we're seeing is a, a very significant danger when Netanyahu starts talking about the Arabs and uh, as, as sort of uniting with the Israelis, as if this is all somehow a popular movement among people. Uh, this is a direct lie. This is a governmental and military to military alliance that has been underway for many, many years, but it remained quiet and in many cases secret for the Saudis in particular, who are le leading this alliance with Israel, particularly under the leadership of the new crown prince, uh, the young Mohammed bin Salman, uh, who has been appointed less than a year and has been orchestrating all of Saudi military and strategic policy, including its leadership of the horrific 
uh, war in in, Le in uh, Yemen that has led to the deaths of thousands of Yemenis, the uh, near starvation of several million people, uh, hundreds of thousands that are now facing cholera without access to the drugs they need to treat it. Uh, it's a disastrous humanitarian crisis uh, in, in Yemen and very much because of the Saudi attack, the Saudi bombing campaigns that continue with direct U.S. involvement. U.S. planes are flying alongside the UAE and Saudi bombers to provide in-air refueling of those bombers so they can bomb Yemeni targets more efficiently. Uh, it's it's a, a humanitarian disaster. But one of the things that's different now is that the Israelis and the Saudi regimes are prepared to acknowledge to the world that they are collaborating, that they are wishing each other nothing but good wishes, that they are eager for normalization, something that has been underway for a long time, but never acknowledged. Uh, the Saudis have decided that it's worth taking whatever public opposition there may be, uh, and there may or may not be public opposition that we ever hear about inside Saudi Arabia. The same for the Israelis. Netanyahu is betting that the anti-Iran fever that he has helped to whip up in recent years will be sufficient to cover any unease among some Israelis, particularly among his own right-wing supporters, uh, about rebuilding a public alliance between Israel and Saudi Arabia. So it's a very dangerous moment because if they start to feel too cocky and that they to feel that the United States will back an Israeli-Saudi initiative against Iran, regardless of how reckless it might be, uh, it could become almost as dangerous as the threat of war in North Korea. This is a very, very dangerous moment. So Phyllis, finally, I want to go back to Netanyahu's comments at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, it happened just after there was a plane crash in Iran, uh, which killed dozens of people. And Netanyahu said something curious. This is what he said. And I've explained we have no quarrel with the people of, the, of, of Iran, only with the regime that torments them. And I take this opportunity to send our condolences to the families of the 66 Iranian civilians shot down or for, that lost their lives in the plane accident today. We have no quarrel with the people of Iran. So that's Netanyahu. And if you listen closely, you heard him say the plane that was, quote, shot down. Now, then he corrected it himself and said that it, it crashed. And by all appearances, it was not actually shot down. It was just an accident. But that to me, Phyllis, I don't know. It just it was an interesting slip. And it um, we learned recently that Israel had discussed plans in the past, uh, going back to the 70s, of shooting down uh, passenger planes if they carried officials from the PLO on board, especially Arafat, its former enemy. And I'm just wondering, you know, you're talking about this moment being dangerous. I mean, what, how far do you think Israel might be prepared to go uh, to achieve its goals in the region, uh, whether it's in the occupied territories with the horrible blockade ongoing in Gaza, or trying to uh, confront Iran, both in Syria, which we talked about, and also in Lebanon, where Iran has a pretty strong ally in Hezbollah. What, what are your concerns for this current moment going forward in, in terms of just how dangerous Israel with its alliance uh, with U the U.S. and Saudi Arabia are? The danger is in Washington. The danger is that the absolute support of the Trump administration, the clarity with which the Trump administration, the ambassador that he chose to serve in Israel a long time settlement backer, uh, the role of his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who has built this kind of bromance with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, the clarity with which the U.S. is making clear that it will back Israel regardless of what Israel does is what makes it so dangerous. I think there is absolutely zero evidence that Israel shot down a plane in Iran. I do not think it was an accident that Netanyahu made that slip and said, that it was shot down. I think it was a signal to the Iranians, this is what we could do if we chose. Uh, it was a threat, it was a signal. I don't think it has any basis of reality, but it gave him a, an astonishingly insulting, cruel, given that 66 people did lose their lives and their families are still mourning, uh, to, to say such a thing. But I think this was less about claiming what Israel did than making clear what it might do. I think there are very few limits uh, you know, we should be very, very wary of what this set of developments may lead to. We'll leave it there. Phyllis Bennis, director of the New Internationalism Project. 
at the Institute for Policy Studies. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.